Excellent. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. So nice to see everybody over here. Wish you all a Freilich and Hanukkah, Lichting and Hanukkah, Hanukkah that should fill all of our homes with light. Welcome tonight to all those in person, most in, first and foremost. In person is always best. For those on Zoom, for those on Facebook Live, and for those on Twitter anytime, try anytime, great home of great Torah content. Okay. Right. We move on to an idea that I wanted to share with you last week, and I ran out of time last week, so I'm able to share it with you this week instead, which is great, because that meant one less idea to prepare. No, it was, it was plenty. Of, <laughs> you know, as a rabbi, like, you know, when you prepare and you left, it's like when you go to the shop and you come home with change, and I say, here, take 20 pounds, buy something, keep the change, and you're like, that was five pounds. It was great. So here, as a rabbi, that's the same, that's the same idea. If you give a shear and you're left with something, you can actually say the next week, that's wonderful. That's lovely. And I want to start with the following idea because it's a, there are a lot of very important, very, very pivotal ideas in Jewish ideology that are, that hinge on this idea. So we read the story last week. Let's just remind ourselves of the story last week because the story from last week is a continuation. The story this week is a continuation of last week. So we read about the wine butler and we read the baker. You got the wine butler and the baker and the wine butler and baker are have done something wrong. They have done something against Melech Mitzrayim, against Paro, who is the king of Egypt. The wine butler, there was a fly in the wine. You can imagine, for the most powerful person in the world, you think of Paro, you know, the guy that you need to think of, you think of like Mao Zedong, you got to think of Kim Jong-un. You think of like an absolute crazed maniac. You're not talking about a normal person. And he found a fly in his wine. And the baker, they found a stone in the bread. And they both got sent to jail. And they didn't know what was going to happen. And they both had dreams. In the middle of the night, they have dreams. The wine butler has a dream that he has three stalks of grapes. And he squeezes out those grapes. And he puts the grapes into the cup of Pharaoh. And he hands the cup to Pharaoh. The bread, the master baker, has this following dream of three big baskets worth of bread on his head. And there's a bird that's eating out of those baskets. And the dreams that Yosef interprets are as follows. Mr. Butler, your dream means the following. In three days from now, the Pharaoh is going to take you out of this terrible hole, and he's going to get you back to be the main wine butler, the chief butler in the, in the palace. Whereas you, Mr. Baker, in three days, Pharaoh is also going to lift, raise you up. He's going to raise your head from the rest of you i.e. you'll be left without a head, right? And that's Yisafar Soshech, <laughs> raise your head. So that's what happens. Exactly what happens. Now, when that happens, Yosef says to this individual, to Mr. Butler, he says, listen, I would like you to remember me. When you get to Pharaoh, say to him, there's a young Jewish boy and he's sitting over there in the dungeons. He doesn't deserve to be there. He's done nothing wrong to be there. Why is he sitting there? And maybe you can get me out of this hellhole. And the parasha finishes off. The Saramashkim, the wine butler, did not remember Yosef, and he forgot it. And now, continues the verse in chapter 41, page 222 in the Art Scroll. Sidurim, Art Scroll It was two years later, Pharaoh had a dream and he didn't know what this dream meant. And there he calls together all his different magicians and all his great advisors. And they all can't tell Pharaoh what the dream means until Yosef shows up and Yosef is able to tell them what the dream means. And Yosef rises to power through that. But why did it take two years for that to happen? So Chazal tell us there was something very wrong that Yosef Atzadik did over here. What Yosef should have done, he should have put or placed his trust in Hashem. And he did not place his trust in Hashem. And therefore, because he didn't place his trust in Hashem, therefore he had to sit in the jail for another two years. And now let me ask you the following question, because this question is extremely important. And it is extremely important for us to understand this. There's a marshal, there's a parable that people tell when they ask the question. There was once a terrible flood. And a man is sitting on his roof. And finally a guy comes by and he says, come, give me a hand. I got a life jacket over here. You put on this life jacket, give me a hand, I'll drag you along the water, I'll get you to safety. He says, no, 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 God's going to help me. A little bit later, a boat comes, and this boat says, come, jump in. 
you're going to drown over here. He goes, listen, I'm, I'm not worried. God's going to save me. A bit later, the water's really up to here already, and there's a helicopter that comes by, and it drops a rope. He goes, hold on to the rope. Come on. We got to get you out of here. He says, listen, God is going to help me. Okay? Helicopter goes, oh, sugar, and drives off. Okay? Saves other people. The guy stands there, and he dies. And he shows up in heaven, and he says to God in heaven, I had bitachon. I trusted you. I trusted you were going to save me. And what did you do? You ditched me. What's that all about? How could you do that? How could you not save me when I told everybody I trust that God's going to save me? And God says, who do you think sent you the fellow with the life jacket? And who do you think sent you the boat? And who do you think sent you the helicopter? Right? So goes the story. And therefore, when we hear this story, it opens up the following question. I don't understand. Yosef is in jail. And things aren't going right for him. And now finally, God has changed everything around. He has made it now that we have these two main servants in Pharaoh's palace at Yosef's beck and call. And he's able to now tell them what these dreams mean. And that way he is going to now get them out of their misery and tell them what's going to happen with them. And Yosef says to himself, perfect opportunity. This guy's getting out of here. When he gets out of here, I'm going to ask him to go to Pharaoh and uh, tell Pharaoh there's this young boy that's languishing in jail that doesn't belong in jail. Come on, Pharaoh, you got to do something. We say, Yosef, ah! You didn't trust in God. How could you? How did, what do you mean I didn't trust in God? I trusted in God. I thought that God sent me a messenger. And if God sends me this messenger and I take advantage of the messenger, what's wrong with that? Why do we have this problem with what Yosef did? That's the question. And that is a question that for years and years has bothered so many people. And I saw a beautiful answer last week that I want to share with you that I think really sets up an understanding in Jewish ideology, what's what. So let's talk about the following. There's an idea called bitachon. Bitachon means I trust in God. And part of bitachon is is that I understand that God provides for me and that everything comes from God and it's not my doing. Part of that is really believing that and understanding that, i.e., you can have people that work their socks off and barely, barely make ends meet. And you can have people that show up to work for an hour a day and are making a killing, a fortune. So why does that happen? Why would you say that? How does that make sense? And sometimes people say, you know what, I'll work harder. I'll work more. And the more I work, the more I'll earn. And part of Bitochon, part of our belief in HaKadosh Baruch Hu is, is that God has assigned everybody a certain amount of money that they are going to earn every year. And that's what you're going to earn. That's what you're going to get. However, there is also another prerequisite condition for this. And that is called Hishtadlus. Hishtadlus means doing your bit, trying, doing something, i.e., Let's say I'm sitting at home and I say to myself, you know what? If God has promised me all this money on Rosh Hashanah, on Rosh Hashanah's decree that Eisenberg should do well or Eisenberg shouldn't do well this year, why in the world am I going to work? Why am I driving myself crazy with all these people in shul and bar mitzvahs and weddings and stone settings? I should tell them all, you know what? I'm done with all you guys. I'm going to sit at home now and I'm going to play on my phone. I'm going to learn and that's it. And God will support me. And I expect every month, to be a knock on the door, a ring on the bell, and as I open up the door, there'll be a man up from the post office there saying, <laughs> I don't know how this happened, but here's a check for you, sir. And I'll go in and I'll get a check. Why should I work? What, what, what for? Why would I do that? What's the answer? God has decreed that in this world, things do not work on their own. Right? You can't do that. You can't just say, well, I'll leave it up to God and I do nothing. I have to do some work for it. Now, how much work do you have to do for it? That's part of the whole discussion. That is the discussion that is very prevalent often amongst people who are working and people are trying to figure out how much time do I have to learn? So you'll speak to people and they'll say to you, I never have any time to learn. Do you know how many hours I work in my business? 
where would I come up with time to learn from? I'm working 12, 13 hours a day. And then I have to travel another hour in each direction. That's 15 hours. You got to give me a, you know, I got to sleep a little bit. You give me a light. You say to the person, well, have you ever thought of working 10 hours a day? Maybe you'd have a bit of extra time. If I work 10 hours a day, I'll never make ends meet. You ever tried it? Sometimes people are working and working and working. And the reality is that they're not even getting that much done. I was listening to a book. I know it sounds ridiculous, but that's what we say nowadays. I wasn't reading a book. I was listening to a book. We've gotten so lazy. We can't even read it ourselves. Somebody else has to read it for us. Mommy, can you read me a story? So you have what's called audiobooks. By the way, Audible, you know, it's very interesting. You know, Audible, the big uh, audiobook library of Amazon was created actually by a Jew, a Jew called Katz from New Jersey. So it makes sense that Yiddish people are so into books, they're so into this whole kind of thing that they created this. So I'm listening to this book and it's called The Four Hour Work Week. And what this fellow in this book says, a fellow by the name of Tim Ferriss, famous individual, he says, people are busy. But just because you're busy doesn't mean that you're getting things done, right? And that's a very interesting point because I've seen this many times. I actually even spoke to them at the office once or twice. And I said, why don't we implement some of the ideas on this? I said, for example, Petra says to me, I'm constantly trying to get things done, but I'm constantly getting interrupted by the phone. I can't do anything. Iris, you know us. You must know what I'm talking about. Yeah, I can never finish the task at hand because every two seconds the phone rings, right? And I said, well, why don't we put on a voicemail or why don't we say, you know what? The phones only open up at 1030 in the morning. That gives you an hour in the morning to do straight work. Like Petra said to me, on Fridays, I get more done in an hour and a half than I get done in four hours on a regular day because the phones are off on Friday. So she comes in and she sits down on the computer and gets all the work done and gets it all printed out and all done and it just quick. Why? I'm not constantly getting interrupted. And we're constantly getting interrupted. You're doing something, oh, an email. You go back to the email, come back. Oh, well, well, what, what? So he's like, this fellow, for example, says, you don't answer emails all day long. You answer emails once or twice a day, and that's it. And you put it in your messages, and you say to yourself, dear customer, dear friend, whatever else it is, in order to be more efficient, I only check my email twice a day, once at 9 o'clock in the morning and once at 5 p.m., once right before I, when I come to work, once right before I leave work, please understand that I will not send any emails outside of those times. And then you turn off your email program and that's it. And guess what? Whoever sends you an email, they'll wait. They'll have to wait till you send them a response. And you put on the bottom, if it's urgent, really urgent, call me or text me. And you'll get a few texts, maybe one or two calls, but you'll have peace and quiet the entire day to work. Otherwise, you're constantly being pulled in a million directions. And so when people say, I need X amount of hours to work, we really have to ask yourself the question, do I really need as much time to work? Or am I actually wasting a lot of that time doing all sorts of things, right? I know you see patients. I'm not talking about everybody, okay? But I know for myself that there are times where I have only an hour where I can do my work because I'm between two different meetings. And if I have an hour, I'll usually get almost everything done I need to get done in that hour. Because what I do is I focus on the task. I don't take any phone calls. I don't do my messages. I don't do anything else. And you just get everything done. So then the next day, the same thing took three hours. So why did that take three hours? So I don't just waste two hours. So people often say to you, I can't afford to work less. That's not true. If you work smarter, not harder, in most instances, you could afford to work less and oftentimes do more in that time as well, if you did it right. So that's just a side point. So you say to yourself, how much should I work? Well, how much you need to work? How much money do you need to be able to live? What is considered normal? So you say to yourself, you know what? The normal amount for a person like me to earn in X amount of hours is this. And you know, that, that makes sense. So am I going to go to office for one hour a day? You can't go to the office for one hour a day because you just don't work enough to be able to make enough money to be able to just do it in one hour a day. If you're the kind of person that could actually live off one hour a day, then you should only work one hour a day. Why are you working 10 hours a day? What for? Just to be able to have more and more and more money, just to be able to keep score with somebody else? Like, what do you need all this money for, right? But sometimes it takes people five hours, some people take eight hours, some people take 10 hours. There's no need to work 15 hours a day. There's no need. It's just because people have gotten into it. I know my brother used to work for banks in New York. They worked him 15, 16 hours a day. He got there six o'clock in the morning, he left at nine, 10 o'clock at night. That's crazy. That's mental. There's no need for that. 
So why did they do that? Because the Mac was making a lot of money on him. And it was this peer pressure that everybody had to work more. I was there the longest. I came first. You came first. I was there later than you were, et cetera, et cetera, because everybody's working on that promotion. If I work hard enough, if I show the bank that literally for the next 10 years, they own me, then maybe I'll get a promotion. And the same is true for some law firms. You work and work and work until you make partner. And the same is true in accountancy firms, et cetera, et cetera. You work like a dog. And other people have said, but why am I working like a dog? What for? What God can't provide for me unless I work 15 hours a day. If I work 10 hours a day, God can't provide for me. It's just not possible. Sure it is. So they say, you know what? God will provide for me. I work 10 hours a day. So you'll like, never make it a partner. So I'll never make it a partner. God will take care of me. Right? That's pitochem. Pitochem means I trust that God will take care of me. Hishtadlus means I do whatever is necessary. I have to do my bit because if I don't do my bit, then God says, you didn't even do your bit. I can't give you money just like that. I can't throw money at you. That's not how I created this world. This world is not meant to be a world of miracles. There's meant to be at least an illusion of Tema, an illusion of natural courses in this world. So we have to say, I, may, I worked in my job. That was the natural course of action to take. And therefore I made money. That looks natural. But it's oftentimes not necessarily the work that you do that actually gets you the money. And so, Yosef says to himself, I'm going to do his status. I need to do my bit. But the thing is as follows. Coming back, let's talk about work first, and then let's come back to, to what Yosef's doing. So let's say I decide I'm going to work five hours a day. Because I believe that five hours is enough to be able to bring enough money naturally for me to be able to live. And I work five hours a day. So you say, isn't that a little bit short? No, I manage on that. And oftentimes you see you will manage on that. If you don't manage on that and you realize you can't do it. So sometimes you up it up to six hours. And sometimes you realize that I wasn't doing enough status. But let's say I said to you, you know what your status is? You know what I do every single week to ensure that I make enough money? Every week I go into Bond's news agent on King's Road. And on Friday, I buy myself a Euro Millions ticket. I don't work the entire week. I buy a Euro Millions ticket at the end of the week. And I'm waiting to win. What will you say to me? Well, I've done my, you know, this actually has a chance of winning 100 million pounds. What you're doing is only going to make you 1,000 pounds or 1,500 pounds this week. So am I not doing more hishtadlis than you? Am I not trying harder than you are? What would you say to me, Malcolm? Does that make sense? Yeah. You think it makes sense? I wouldn't say that, you know, <laughs> I wouldn't do that. Don't do that. Right. Why? Why does that make sense? Because you can't just buy a lottery ticket and think God's going to send you the money with the lottery. Right. Because a lottery is one in a 50 or 100 million chance of winning this stupid thing. So you say, but if I win, I win 100 million pounds or 20 million pounds or 30 million pounds. Yeah, but you can't live like that. You can't base your entire livelihood on a lottery ticket. Now. If you earn a livelihood, whatever it is, and you say to yourself, God, I'd love to be able to give up on all that, only do from now on pro bono work. I'd like to help people. I'd like to help children. I'd like to sit and learn, et cetera, et cetera. Help me win the lottery. So once a week, I go into the bonds news agent and I pay for lottery ticket. And I say, God, if you want me to win the lottery, I'll win. If you don't want me to win the lottery, I won't win. Okay, you can do that. Because at the end of the day, you say to yourself, I've done my hishtadlis. I've done what's normal as far as trying to earn a living. And now... If I'm just trying to sort of give God the opportunity that if he wants to, he can send me more money. Yeah. You know the story where the guy who davened the whole year for, for winning the lottery. He's davening, he's davening. Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, he's davening, he's davening. I'm constantly, finally, like by Neila, there's like, I say, well, you just buy a stupid ticket already. Right. You can't just daven that you should win the lottery. Because like, God, one day the guy's going to show up, he's not going to show up and give you 100 million pounds. Right. So you have to at least open up the channels by buying the lottery ticket. But if you only buy the lottery ticket, you've not done the requisite established. You've not done what you should do in order to be able to prove to God that you've done your bit in this world. I've not done my bit. Buying a lottery ticket is not considered doing your bit. That's throwing up a hope. Like throwing up a prayer. All right, I got five pounds off. Let me buy a lottery ticket because I know without five pounds, I'm not going to be able to do anything else with it anyway. And I'm so poor. Let me buy a lottery ticket. Let God make me win. That's not how we work. That's not how God works in this world either. And therefore, says the Chazonish. The Chazonish has a famous sefer called Emun Bitochen, and in that sefer he explains as follows. Yosef was allowed to go ahead and was allowed to ask someone for help. There was nothing wrong with asking for help because that is the natural course of action. 
And therefore, when the boat shows up for the guy who's on the roof, he's got to take the boat. He can't say, God's going to save me. This is the guy that God sent to save you. That's the natural way of being saved. When the helicopter comes, he says, look, this is your last chance, says God. This is your natural way of being saved. Grab hold of that rope and we'll get you out of there. Fine. But if I ask the wine butler to help me out, is that really naturally a good solution? Think about it. This fellow was at the top of the totem pole in Egyptian society, right? Imagine if you had a fellow, okay, we, I'm going to try to do this with as little racism as possible. But imagine if you had a fellow who was a down and out, whatever he is, whatever race, whatever place he comes from, he comes from the projects, as they would call in America, or the council estate. He got, his father was a druggie and his mother was a prostitute and the guys never stood a chance in life and he never got an education and he's got only fillings in his teeth and he's eating chocolate all his life. You know, this is a guy, these are the guys that are like, you know, rough and ready. And he's in jail and he's sitting there with one of the greatest ministers in the cabinet who's in jail for a few days for whatever he did. He ran a red light and we put him in jail for two days and he's coming back out. And he's in there and he's sitting there and he's saying to this cabinet mister, I promise you I'm innocent. I'm innocent, ma'am. Mate, you got to get me out of here. Do you really believe that when this cabinet minister comes out, he goes, I met this down and out in jail. That was really nice. And he said to me, he's not guilty. Do you think he's going to actually go to Rishi Sunak and tell him, I think this guy needs pardoning? I don't, I don't even know if they do pardoning in this country. In America, the president has the ability to pardon. I don't even know if you can pardon people in this country. But let's imagine it was America. He's going to go to President Biden and say, this guy needs to be pardoned. Why? His father was a drug addict and his mother was a prostitute and he grew up without an education and he's been framed for all of this. Or is a guy going to come out and say, low life, piece of garbage. You deserve to sit in jail. I don't believe a word you say. Right? Which one of the two is more likely? The second is much more likely. It's much more likely that the guy is going to be like, why should I listen to you? The dreg of society who's been sitting in this jail for 12 years and who says to me, I'm innocent. You know what my father said to me? My father told me that he used to go visit people in jail as chief rabbi used to have to go visit people in jail. And he said, I learned very quickly when you go to jail, you never ask people what they've done because nobody's ever done anything wrong. But what do you say to people? What do they say you did? What have you allegedly done? You cannot say to somebody, what have you done? Well, they say I killed somebody. And well, no, never. They say I embezzled money. Did you? Never. I'm sitting here for no reason. Nobody's going to say that. I just say I killed somebody. Really? Yeah, I, with my bare hands, I just wrung his neck. But, but you know, don't worry about it. Yeah? They don't say that. Everybody says I've done nothing. You go to jail, it's a whole bunch of people that tell you that they've never, ever done anything wrong. So here's this Jewish fellow. Now, we'll see in this week's parasha that the Jews are actually looked down upon by the Mitzrayim. The Mitzrayim, the Egyptians, could not even sit together with the Jews. So the Yosef, when he made a meal, he says he sat himself, the brothers sat themselves, and the Egyptians sat themselves. The Egyptians would never eat together. They wouldn't break bread with the Hebrews. It was considered an abomination. It was disgusting to them. Who sits with these Jews? Ew, Jews. That's what it was. And you read how he refers to over here. Rashi tells us when finally the Saramashkin comes and he owns up to Pharaoh, I might have a, a, an ace up my sleeve. I know of a guy called Joseph and he's down in the pit. He said, Vishami Tanu, he tells in the whole story that, you know, we did something wrong. And then what happened was, is that we had these dreams and we didn't know what they were. And we went to this guy. And then the verse tells you, if you look at verse 12, so that's page 224, Perik, Mem Aleph, base. 41.12. Vishami tonu there with us. Nar Ivri. Nar means a young lad, but also a fool. A fool. A Jewish one. Evel Dabachim. He's an Eved. He's a servant. He doesn't deserve to be promoted or anything. So do you see how he talks about him? Do you see how he denigrates him? Right? Imagine if you had a real racist who was in jail and sitting next to a person of color. Any color you want it to be. Right? Now, this is not the point over here. And he comes out and this, this black or brown or whatever individual says to him, could you please help me out? And he comes out and goes, this stupid whatever, right? He's not going to come out and say, you know, the guy was really, really nice. Yes, I know the skin color is the wrong skin color, but he's so nice. And you know, by the way, it's really, it's freaky that. 
because I my wife went recently here to there's a lady called Christine that does nails. She's on the corner of Richmond Avenue and King's Road. And we had a simple, so she went and she had her nails done. And the lady there told her that she is black, she's of African origin, and she used to be a nurse. And, and in the NHS hospitals, she was an A&E nurse, and she used to come to people, and she says, can I help you? And they would say, no, I don't want you touching me. I don't want you touching me. And finally, one point another woman would say, listen, you know what, you're, you're about to bleed out, so I think you might be better off when I touch you and try to suture up your, your stitches over here. You don't want to bleed out just because you don't want a black person touching you. They're like, well, mm, they look around like, oh, there's no other nurses here. Oh, well, all right. And then she spoke to them after the end. They were like, you know, you know what, you're okay. You're not so bad. Yeah, okay, fine. But that's that kind of racism. That's what the Egyptians were like to the Jews. They didn't like the Jews. So you're talking about over here a man who is highly racist against you, who thinks you're an idiot, who thinks you deserve to sit in jail, who thinks you never deserve to be promoted at all and you don't deserve to come out of this jail. And you're asking that guy to help you. And you think that guy's going to help you? You know what that's like? That's like buying the lottery ticket and hoping to win and never going to work. Because you buy a lottery ticket and you never go to work and you don't do a stitch of work and you say, God, I bought a lottery ticket. You're going to send me all the money. God's going to say, look, a lottery ticket is not considered shtadlus. That's not considered really trying. You didn't try. You didn't even make any effort to make any money. At least make it look like you made an effort. Here you bought something that's like a desperate call. Oh, you know, you buy money. And I've seen many times, it's unfortunate, you go into some of these shops, whether the Bonds news agent, you go into Tesco, and sometimes you see the poorest members of society are always the ones that are gambling away the money. And they're going in and they go, have you ever seen them? They buy like five, eight scratch cards. You ever see, you know what I'm talking about, Michael? Yeah, Iris, have you seen it? Yeah. You think to yourself, go and buy, pay for your heating with that. Buy yourself food, but they always dream to themselves. You know what? I made 20 quid. If I spend 18 of that on scratch cards and I win 100,000 pounds, as it says on the scratch card, I'm going to be wealthy. So it's worth the 18 quid of the 20 quid to put them in the scratch cards. But they don't realize you don't stand a chance in hell of winning that. What are your chances of winning that? You just thrown away 18 pounds. It was almost all money you had. That's 90% of the money that you had down the drain. That's desperation. That's not how a sane individual goes about getting their money and that's not called ishtadlis desperation is a step over from ishtadlis you never when you say to god look i'm desperate and so therefore i'm going to trust somebody who's a drug dealer to make money for me or i'm going to trust some kind of charlatan or some kind of ponzi scheme and that's how i'm going to make my money so god says that's desperation that's not that's not ishtadlis that's not cold working and doing what you should in order to be able to get to to get your your things from hashem so therefore, we see over here in Yosef an act of desperation, not an act of ishtadlus. It was an act of asking somebody who is racist against you, who thinks you're the dreg of society, to help you. That, you know, could you imagine being in jail and asking, a, you know, a Nazi, a Mahshamai, to help you out? Do you ever think in a million years that this Nazi is going to come out and he's going to look, he's like actually a really nice Jew in there, like, you know, maybe I should help him. Stupid Jew, language in jail forever. You'd never ask a neo-Nazi to help you out. If you were in jail with Adolf Hitler, would you ask him a favor? I mean, you might want to kill him, but you wouldn't ask him a favor. And if you do, what does it show about you? What does it say about you when you ask a guy like Adolf Hitler a favor? You're so desperate, you're even not willing to ask one of the greatest enemies of the Jewish people to help you out. When the chances of him being willing to help you are virtually zero. So you ask somebody to help you out where the chances of him to help you out are virtually zero, that's not called doing your bit. That's desperation. Desperation is not doing your bit. And therefore, Yosef deserved to be punished because on his level, God says to him, I wouldn't have expected that desperation from you. That desperation is wrong. You want to ask someone to help you and it makes sense, like the guy in the boat, like the guy in the helicopter, like the guy with the life vest, that makes sense. You better take that help. If you don't take that help and you get up to heaven, God's going to say, I sent you a messenger. You should have taken the messenger. And now that you died, it's your fault that you died. You should have taken the help I sent you. Because that wasn't a clutching at desperation attempt to get out of that. That was real. When you're clutching at desperation and you do that, that's wrong. Can't do that. That's why Yosef gets punished over here. So that's the first idea. It's a very, very important idea. This idea of bitachon, hishtadlus, how much hishtadlus to do, how it works with making money. All that is very, very important. And it comes out over here. I thought that was a very beautiful idea. Okay. 
Idea number one. Idea number two. Also very interesting. Over here in the same, we just read about it before. We were talking about this. So you have Pharaoh has this terrible dream and he doesn't know what the dream means and he's calling together all these people. He says, you need to help me. You need to explain this dream to me. What is this dream all about? And finally the Saramashkim, the wine butler comes forward and he says, listen. Verse 9, page 222. Mem Aleph Tes. Vaidaber Saramashkim, the Saramashkim spoke up as Paralema to Pharaoh saying, Eschato ayani maskaryam. Today I remember my sins. Parakotam al Avadov Parak got angry on his servants and he put me in jail together in the house of the main butcher, myself and the main baker. And we both had a dream in one night, me and this baker, and the baker and I, and each one of us dreamt the correct dream with the actual interpretation of the dream. And with us there was this Nar Ivri, as we said before, with us there was this Jewish lad who was the servant to this butcher. And we told him, and he actually was able to tell us what our dreams meant. And then exactly that happened, exactly what he said. He says, I made it back to my shtela, I made it back to my job, and the other fellow got killed. Says the Meshach Chochm, Ramesim Chodvinsk. Why does the Samashim say, ani My sins I remember today. Why are you talking about your sins? Just tell me that I know a guy that could do it for you. Like, why do you have to tell me Oh, I just remembered today that I actually screwed up. What is that supposed to mean? Why do you have to say that? If I said to you, says you, Michael, I really, really need something desperately. I need a person that could help me out with my eyes. You'd say, you know what? The guy I'd recommend to you, Jeff Quartz, right? You wouldn't tell me a story. You know what? I was once walking and I had a patient. Patient fell down. He didn't know what to do. And he hurt his eye. And he tell me this whole story. And this is, and then he went to the hospital. He met a guy. Just tell me about Jeff Quartz. Right? I didn't need to, for you to tell me this whole long rendition of the story, how you met the guy. I don't care how you met the guy. I just want his, I just want his business card. Give me his telephone number. Tell me where I can get him. And that's it. And then the Sar Hamashkim goes off on one over here. And remember, you're standing in front of Pharaoh. So what are you telling stories for? I remember I sinned at the time and I, I was put in jail, et cetera, et cetera. So what does that mean? What's going on over here? So Meshe Chochmah says a very interesting idea. And what Meshe Chochmah says is as follows. He says, sometimes we as human beings, things happen to us and we don't understand them or we don't attribute them correctly. And because we don't understand them or we don't attribute them correctly, we always think, oh, I didn't deserve this. Or I don't know why this happened. And it's only much later in life. Have you ever had it where something happened like a year later and you go, oh, now I get it. Now I understand. Right? I was listening to a story recently, a beautiful story that I heard. There were these, this young couple and they wanted some landscaping done in their front garden, as well as they were going to build these beautiful six steps up into the house. It was going to become like the centerpiece of the house. And they got a contractor and he came, recommended, whatever. And he came by and he had a look. He goes, yes, I'll be able to do it for you. All I need is $10,000 just as a down payment. I'll be able to start the work tomorrow. Husband calls wife. He says, they need 10 grand. He says, she says, 10 grand sounds a lot of money <laughs> up front. He goes, listen, the guy comes recommended, whatever. They gave him the 10 grand in cash. That was the end of that money. There it went. You can imagine they weren't all too happy and they now don't have the money to be able to do all that landscaping. And all they could do is put in two steps. That's it. That great dream that they have that was going to be these six steps. It was going to look beautiful. Down to two. Anyway, many years later, this fellow got into a terrible car accident and he was in hospital for three months and he was finally able to come out of hospital. And they said, okay, now we're going to take you to a rehab. And he said, look, I've been by myself for three months. I can't spend another three months away from my family. Please, I beg of you, allow me to go home. And the family was able to pull all sorts of corners and they found a doctor was going to come visit him and a physical therapist was going to come and the insurance was going to pay for it. And they got it and they're basically almost there. And they're about to discharge the man and suddenly one of the nurses goes, ah, wait. Wait, what? He says, you're only allowed to go to a facility that has a maximum of two steps into the facility. Do you have how many steps are there into your house? He says, don't worry. There's only two. Signed the papers and got out. And they turn around and says, you know what? If the guy, you know, maybe at the time we thought it was the most... Worst thing that ever happened to us, but turned out to be the best thing for this individual. 
So sometimes it takes years for us to realize, but also sometimes it takes years for us to own up to our mistakes. We've done something wrong and for years we contend and we say, I was right. I never did anything wrong. It had nothing to do with me. It was always somebody else. It was somebody else's fault and they did this and they did that. And part of becoming mature is realizing, hey, wait a second, sometimes it is your fault. Don't blame the rest of the world for your problems. If you screwed up, say, just raise your hands and said, I messed up. Okay, it was me. Easy to say that. Well, in this, in this crowd, it is. <laughs> yeah, it's not always easy to say that. But this individual, this fellow, probably for years thought to himself, it's my fault. It's my fault that a stupid fly ended up inside the wine. We checked the wine. We sifted the wine. This was the finest wine that you could get in Egypt. This was... You can imagine, by the way, if this was the wine butler to Pharaoh, this wasn't rubbish wine. This wasn't like Chateau Garbage that you get for four pounds in, in Tesco. This was like, you know, this was 97, 98, 99 on the, uh, on the wine list. And you drink it and it's just perfect. It's, it's just what it's meant to be, right? And there was a little fly that ended up in there. You can imagine they must have sifted. Who knows what they've done to this wine to make this perfect wine? And now there's a fly in it. And he says to himself, that wasn't fair. How did I end up in jail? I'm innocent. I've always been innocent, et cetera, et cetera. And now suddenly two years later, Pharaoh has this dream. And Pharaoh has this dream. He goes, I don't know how to solve this dream. And finally, finally, it comes to the point where he says, this wine butler wakes up and says, wait a minute. I remember there was a guy that I met in jail who understood what dreams meant. But how did I learn of this guy? Because God put me there. Why did God put me there? I must have deserved to go there. And therefore, there's a revelation that is happening now in the mind of this individual. And the fellow suddenly says, es I have now suddenly come to the realization that when I screwed up, I actually did screw up. Oh, I deserve that. And God sent me there for a reason, for a purpose. That wasn't for no reason. It was so that I would meet this fellow, that I would have this dream, I would then have it interpreted, and then I would come out, and then Pharaoh would have the dream, and then I'd be able to pull this guy out and go, aha, ace up my sleeve, I got this guy. Yes? But it's only now, with hindsight, looking back at the entire story, as this story unfolds, that you could say, you know what? Now I finally get it. I understand. I get it. It makes sense to me. And sometimes it will take years for us to make sense of things. And sometimes we'll never, ever make sense of it. But what we learn over here from the wine butler is that sometimes you need to keep on looking back and saying to yourself, are there extra pieces of the puzzle that I now suddenly have where I can go, ah, I got it. I understood it. And that's what happens to the wine butler here. The wine butler suddenly realizes, ah, I get it. I understand. And when he understands, and he's able to say, now I know why this happened. Now I know I ended up in jail. Now I know that I was wrong. But now I know that the whole thing. He's telling Pharaoh this whole story because he realizes I must have done something wrong. I ended up in jail on purpose. And this was all meant to be because I was meant to bring this guy to you. Even this guy who doesn't believe in God and who doesn't like Jews still sees the hand of God on this. Now, I'd like to mention one last idea, a Hanukkah idea, and with this we'll finish. This is an idea that I heard from Rabbi Shlomo Farhi, which I thought was a very, very beautiful idea that I'd like to share with you, and that's as follows. The, only, he only says part of this, Rabbi Farhi, part of this I'm going to add on as my own. There are different ways or different things that darkness does to a person. Darkness can blind a person in different ways. Number one, when things are dark, you can't see what's what. So you're walking down the street and you can't see that there's a pit, that there's black ice or whatever else it is. It's all dark outside. So you don't know what's going on over here. And therefore, that's one pitfall of darkness. One pitfall of darkness is the fact that you cannot see. But there's another pitfall of darkness. And the second pitfall of darkness is that sometimes you see something that looks good and it's bad. So you go running over to someone because you think it's your friend. You are hey, wait, wait, wait. And the guy turns around and you're like, oh, who's this? This guy doesn't look too friendly at all. Now you realize, hey, I shouldn't have really gone anywhere near this guy. 
But what's happened now is that darkness sometimes is a dangerous enemy in that it makes an enemy look like a friend and a friend look like a foe. And it confuses people. Number one, I don't see. Number two, there's confusion also sometimes. That the darkness not only means I don't see the danger, but sometimes when I see something good, I will interpret it as bad. And when I see something bad, I will interpret it as good. And for both of those things, we have light. Light is there to get rid of that darkness. Hanukkah, as you can see behind us, the lights, that's there to get rid of the darkness. Darkness. Yavon is known as darkness. Choshech. The golos of Yavon is darkness because we say that Yavon confused people's priorities. There was two things going on. Number one, they didn't want people to learn. And number two, they wanted people to have confused priorities. Understand this, don't understand that. This is how the world runs, et cetera, et cetera. So that is one idea that we have with light and darkness. But I was given another very interesting idea, which I think translates more to our generation. There's one other thing where you can see I can't, where you can say I can't see. Do you know when else you don't see? And it's really annoying when that happens. Have you ever had it? You come, especially I've had it over here. You come out of the car park and you turn left, 8, 820 in the morning, just as the sun is pretty low down on the horizon. And you turn around and what happens? You're blinded by the glare. The glare is over there. There have been times I've been driving down Hilton Crescent over here. And I thought to myself, I'm going to smash another car because it's such a narrow road. People park on both sides and I can't see in front of me because the sun's in my eyes. And even though I've put down, you know, this blind thing that you put down in your car, I still can't see. And I'm like, please, please, you know, I hope I don't, you're just driving really, really slowly. And then sometimes I think to myself, it's better to just go down the hill. You're better off going down the hill and risking Barry New Road and getting stuck over there rather than risking going down Hilton Crescent. You can't see anything. Sometimes you are blinded by too much light. That was a new idea that I've never heard before. And that is what we have nowadays. Nowadays, we have been bombarded with information. Anybody with a smartphone in their hand is bombarded with information. I mean, you know what you're walking around with in your hand? You're walking around with a bigger CD collection than anybody's ever had in the history of mankind. Any radio station. Remember you used to go into a radio station? Did you ever used to work in radio, Michael? You never worked in hospital radio? No? Steve Wolf did work in hospital radio. I know you worked in hospitals. But you go into a, a hospital radio station, and they're probably at 1,000 CDs, 2,000 CDs, with all sorts of compilations and mixes, and you can choose, and people ask for songs, and hopefully you have everything. Today, somebody with Spotify has 60, 70 million tracks at their fingertips. Apple Music, same thing. And then all of the other podcasts are millions and millions of podcasts on there. And then you can Google whatever you want to. And you have the power to pay with whatever you want to. All that is on your fingertips. And this little machine I hold in my hand has got so much power, so much information, so much. And yet because there's so much information there, what has it done to us? It's made us blind. It's bamboozled us. It's brought us into a situation where actually we don't know what's what anymore. Nobody knows what's right. Nobody knows what's wrong. Everything's been thrown at you in a million different directions. A message over here, a video over there, an influencer, or this and that. This is how we have to dress. This is how we have to look. This is how we have to walk. We lost a sense of normalcy. And so Hanukkah is also, by the way, the light needs to be in the darkness. There needs to be, you know, cannot light Hanukkah candles during the day. You have to light it when it's getting dark because that's the only time that light makes a difference. In the day, another little light, as we learned by Pesach, you can't do B'dikas Chomets during the day because what's your candle going to help you? You won't find anything with a candle because it's, it's light out anyway. The candle's not going to do anything. We need the candle to do something. We need the light of Hanukkah to do something also. And the light of Hanukkah can only do something. The light of Hanukkah does something when you don't envelop with it with a million other volts or watts of light, et cetera, et cetera, that you end up not being able to see your light of the Torah because I'm being bamboozled with a million other things. That is also what Hanukkah is all about. Hanukkah is not only about bringing light into the darkness, but it's also sometimes creating darkness around the light so that light can shine. If you fill your head with all sorts of nourish, you know, all sorts of rubbish, how do you expect that that little bit of Torah that you learned should have any space there? 
when all you can think about is the most recent TV show and the most recent this that you saw and the most recent, you have all this stuff taking up and vying for space. And everybody's vying for, for our headspace now. That's what these, these phones are trying to do. They're all trying to vie for your space, whether it is Facebook, whether it's LinkedIn, whether it is Instagram, whether it's Snapchat, they're vying for your attention again and again and again. And we don't have any attention anymore to give attention to the things that are really important in our lives. So that little candle gets snuffed out, but not by darkness, but by too much light. And Hanukkah is there to teach us the other idea. You need to be able to create some darkness around that light so that light can shine. You need to create a little bit of space of other space inside your head so the Torah has room for you. Because if you don't, you'll end up not having any space for the Torah because you have filled your head with everything else other than what's important. And if there's no darkness, you won't be able to see the light. Those are the ideas I wanted to share with you. Ideas on the Pasha, ideas on Hanukkah. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. Look forward to Hashem to seeing you again next week. Thank you for joining me on Zoom, Facebook Live, Terra anytime, David Eisenberg at gmail.com if you want to get in touch. And thank you to all of you for coming. Thank you very much.